the 75-day interval, as you know, this is only mentioned one area in Scripture, and, uh, but I think it's an important thing to, to, to go through because I think these things actually happen during that interval. This world has to be prepared for the millennial kingdom, and there will be things that happen during this time frame that we will learn about today. So if you would, please stand for reading of God's Word. We honor God by standing when we read His Word. It is the precious, inerrant Word of God. Daniel chapter 12, verse 11 and 12. And from that time, the, from the time that the daily sacrifice is taken away and the abomination of desolation is set up, there shall be 1,290 days. Blessed is he who waits and comes to the 1,335 days. Our Father, we thank you for your word. Thank you that this is the truth. Thank you that there are actually things happening during this time frame that we'll learn about today that are significant and important for us to know. And thank you that you are our God, and because you are alive, we have hope, and we can be the most optimistic of all people that live on this earth, because the King is coming. Thank you, Lord, for this time to study the Word. In Jesus' name, amen. Please be seated. As you know, the theme of Revelation is, Jesus is coming. Jesus is hopefully coming today. Coming in judgment, and he's coming to reign as King of kings and Lord of lords. Uh, again, we just completed the bold judgments, and we know that the world has been, been just decimated. There has been earthquakes that have moved every mountain. There's, there's, there's been uh, hail, bombs of hail, 75 to 100 pounds, just carpet bombing earth. It has been just tragedy after tragedy. The, all the waters have been turned into blood, the salt waters and the fresh waters, and it is a terrible situation that is existing here. We know that Jesus said something very significant. In Matthew 24, 22, unless those days were, be, were, were shortened, no flesh would be saved alive. But for the elect's sake, they'll be shortened. Now, who are the elect in context? I believe it's the nation of Israel. He's coming back. He's coming back to specifically uh, the whole tribulation period is for the Jewish people to recognize their national sin of rejecting Messiah and plead for him to return and they will actually do this a few days before the end of the tribulation. We saw that in Hosea 5.15 5, 5, and chapter 6, verse 1 and 2. Now, we know that this time will be awful, and Jesus is going to intervene, or nobody would be alive. But he's intervening for the sake of his, his people, the Jewish people. Uh, God will provide a safe place for his people. Remember, the begin, in the middle of the tribulation, we were familiar with the 1260 days. That was the first part of the tribulation. Then there's the abomination of desolation that's set up in the holy place, the naos, the holy of holies. And there's the last 1260 days when the Jewish people see what the prophet Daniel was talking about in Daniel chapter 9, the abomination of desolation being set up. Those who are loyal to Yahweh, those who are loyal to the true God, Jehovah, will make their exit into Basra or Petra to find their place of safety, and God will protect them there. Now, there is a place on this earth that Antichrist will not have uh, jurisdiction over. He will, he will be, a, there'll be a global government for sure, but there will be a place. Now, there is a map, there's a picture of this, and the map is showing us that this area is Jordan, and Ammon, Moab, and Edom will not be controlled by the Antichrist. Now, I don't know why, but God is just in his sovereignty, has selected these folks to be safe, and this is a safe place. Remember, they'll go from Jerusalem down to, I don't have the picture here, but Basra or Petra is in Edom, and this will be their safe place, their safe place. So, with that spoken, uh, we also know that Jesus, when he returns, he will return to Basra. That'll be one of the things that he does. Free the remnant, the remnant will believe, and then he'll have his victory ascent up, to, up into Jerusalem, where he'll stand on the Mount of Olives, the Mountain will be split in two, and that's when the kingdom will start. And Revelation 11:15 will have come to full fruition. The kingdoms of this world have become the kingdoms of our Lord and His Christ, and He shall reign. How long? Forever, forever. That's right. The King is coming, folks. And we're going to talk about the 75-day interval. Now, with the victory secured, the millennial reign of Christ is imminent, but not yet because there's this 75-day interval that has to take place spoken of by Daniel. So, I would like, uh, uh, would you put up on the screen the next one? Thanks. Uh, Daniel chapter 11, 12 talks about two different time frames. One is 1290, 
and one is uh, 1335. So I want you, I just put this up here. This is the beginning of the tribulation. This is the first half of the tribulation. This is when the peace treaty is signed between Antichrist and the people of Israel, allows them to build their temple, that sort of thing. That's Daniel 9, 27. For 1260 days, Antichrist is coming to power. Remember, he comes by, into power slowly. He comes by deception, by deception. Then we know in the middle of the tribulation, there will be the desecration or the abomination of desolation that occurs. That marks the midpoint. And then the last 1260 days occurs, and then Messiah comes back. Jesus will come back. The 30-day interval we have seen in our text today, and I'll go through again in just a second, it will take this long for the abomination of desolation to be dealt with, and 45 days it will take the sheep and goat judgments, and several other things will happen during this time frame that we will cover. So that kind of brings you up to speed where we are. So think about what has happened on earth. The earth itself has experienced massive destruction, massive devastation with the bold judgments, the earthquakes, the hail, and that, that sort of thing. Earth is in terrible shape, and humanity is in terrible shape. And it'll take time to clean up the, clean up the mess, to clean up, it'll be a cleanup effort that will take time. Now, I believe this. The restoration of the decimated earth must occur supernaturally. God is going to have to do something to straighten this whole thing out because it will be so devastated that it would never be normal and never be a paradise, never be a millennial kingdom for Jesus to reign unless he did something special. So he will redo the earth. Now, Arnold Fruchtenbaum in his book, Footsteps of Messiah, is going to give us some steps. So this is excer ex excerpted. I was going to say exerted. Excerpted, taken out. I should have said that. From Footsteps of the Messiah. This is his his listing. Now, several people put this in different order. Some people leave out different spots, but I think Arnold covers this pretty well, so we're going to take his stuff. So the number one thing that happens is the removal of the abomination of desolation. We read that in Daniel chapter 12, verse 11. I'll read it again. And from the time that the daily sacrifice is taken away, that Jewish people will have their temple worship during the tribulation period. They'll be able to worship Messiah uh, worship God, not Messiah, worship God the way they did in the Old Testament. That'll be restored. The sacrifices will be restored and that sort of thing. But it will be cut off when Antichrist really comes to power. When the wrath of Antichrist really comes, he will then turn on the Jewish people in the middle of the tribulation, insist that everyone take the mark of the beast, that everyone worship him. If you don't, you die. If you don't, you cannot buy or sell or function in this world. The threat is real, and most of the world will cave and follow him in mass. So, we have the removal of the abomination of desolation. And the, it, it's, the, the abomination of desolation, again, is the image of the beast. We saw that in 1314. The Antichrist will demand worship of the image or die, and he will insist that you take the mark of the beast to buy or sell. And I don't know if I really messed you up with that, Reagan, but I apologize if I did, so... Uh, we have learned that Satan, I believe, Satan possesses the Antichrist in the middle of the tribulation. What was the impetus for this? Because in Revelation chapter 12, verse 7, we see that, that Satan instigates a rebellion in heaven. He is then booted out of heaven and thrown to the earth. Heaven rejoices, but it says in that section of Scripture, woe to the earth because Satan has been cast down to you. And what does he first do? What's his first, one of, the, one of the first things that he does? He chases the remnant, those who are fleeing, those who will not take the mark of the beast, those Jewish people who know that their safe place is in Basra. They will flee, and he will chase them as an army chases them. They'll come as a flood to them, it says in that scripture. And then the earth does something magnificent for the protection of God's people. It opens up and swallows up Antichrist armies. And then Satan is infuriated because his army has been swallowed up and these folks have had their escape into Basra to their safe place. And then he turns on the, the, the two groups of people, the Jews that are loyal to Jehovah, loyal to the true God, and those believers that are tribulation saints. We see that in Revelation 12, 17, 
And the dragon, who is Satan, was enraged with the woman. And remember, he went through all that uh, descriptions of who the woman is and who the, who the dragon is and that sort of thing, who's Israel. And he went to make war with the rest of her offspring. And there's two offspring. Number one is those who keep the commandments of God. These are the ones that were loyal to Yahweh. You're loyal to Jehovah, the Jewish people. And then there's another group and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. Remember, these aren't believers in Messiah yet. They do not believe until the last part of the tribulation. This is the middle of the tribulation. They make their escape, and at the last part, last few days, they will then believe that Jesus is the Messiah. We went through that information. So the tribulation saints will be a target. The Jewish people will be a target. So we've learned that. Now, this abomination of desolation is pretty amazing. It will mesmerize the world. Remember, it will speak. It will speak. It will actually, like, come to life. And it will breathe. And there's an insistence that you worship this, this image, take the mark of the beast, or you are doomed. Now, God, in his graciousness, God, in his favor to humanity, in Revelation chapter 14, I don't know if you remember this, sends out three angels. And the first angel has the gospel of the Lord Jesus, and he's circulating through the earth, and all the world will hear the gospel. Every little island, every little people group, it's not happening through CNN or, 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 or any other media outlet. It is happening by God accomplishing this at the very end with this angel going around. And then a second angel is released and says, Babylon has fallen. Babylon has fallen. Antichrist kingdom is fallen. And then a third angel says this, in Revelation 14.10, if anyone, this is a huge warning, if anyone worships the beast in his image and receives his mark on his forehead or on his hand, he himself shall also drink of the wine of the wrath of God. And I don't know if you remember this, but that wrath is thumos. And that is an outburst of wrath, violent, passionate anger that God will have at that point, which is pulled out, poured out full strength full strength into the cup of his indignation. That's wrath or gay. That's a controlled wrath. He shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the lamb. Anyone who takes the mark of the beast is doomed and will end up in the lake of fire. So that's a great impetus for humanity, at least for believers, not to take the mark, no matter what kind of torture comes your way. Now, we do not know why. I do not know why. I couldn't figure that. I couldn't find it. Why the desecration of the temple remains for 30 days. I don't, we don't know why beyond the end of the tribulation. And when you do not understand something in Scripture and you've tried to dig and find it, just run to Deuteronomy 29.29. 29. The secret things belong to the Lord. But those things that are revealed are revealed to us and our children forever. Number one, number one, the abomination of desolation will be cleaned up. Number two things that happen, the Antichrist and the false prophet will be thrown into the lake of fire. That's Revelation chapter 19, verse 20 and 21. It says this, and the beast was taken. Now remember, Jesus comes back in, in, in Revelation 19. He comes back on the white horse, and he's king of kings, and he's lord of lords. And he has this, this bloodbath against the earth dwellers that are rebelling against him and the Antichrist and the false prophet. And the beast was taken, and with him the false prophet who worked the signs, these miracles in his presence, by which he deceived those, oh, watch this, who take the mark. Anyone who takes the mark has fallen for Satan's deception. It's false prophet, his proxy. The mark of the beast, and those who worshiped his image, these were cast alive into the lake of fire, burning with brimstone. There's something significant that is happening here. The unholy trinity. The unholy trinity. Remember, Satan is the father. Antichrist is the son. The false, the false prophet is the Holy Spirit. They will be definitively dealt with. The counterfeit son, the counterfeit Holy Spirit will end up in the lake of fire and Satan will be de dealt with, the counterfeit father, will be put in a pit for a thousand years. No more demonic influence upon the earth in the millennial reign. 
But the astounding thing is, when Satan is released for a short time, in Revelation chapter 20, he deceives the nations as the sand of the sea, showing us that it's not all Satan, but it's the depravity of human humanity from the original sin that happened in the garden. We are depraved and need a Savior. So, more on that a little later. Now, we're going to talk about, just a second, I'm going to take a little segue here, talking about Satan's abodes. Where does Satan dwell? Well, his abodes are where he lived in the past, present, and future. And we know that in the past, he was the anointed cherub. He stood before the, before the, before, before the throne of God. And, I, and many believe that he was the worship leader, and he was the one that, that led that whole thing. He was the one that was most perfect and most powerful of all God's creation. And we pick that up in Ezekiel chapter 28, verse 14. You were the anointed cherub who covers the throne. And God says, I established you. You were on the holy mountain of God. Talking about the privilege that he had before he fell. You walked back and forth in the midst of the fiery stones. You were perfect in your ways from the day that you were created. He is a created being till iniquity was found in you. And then he says in verse 16, Therefore I cast you as a profane thing out of the mountain of God. I destroyed you, O covering cherub. And he says, verse 17, Your heart was lifted up because of your beauty. You corrupted your wisdom for the sake of your splendor. I cast you to the ground. That is what has happened to Satan. His first abode in the past was before the throne of God. Where he lives now, where he lives now, his second abode presently, is the atmospheric heavens. How do I know that? Am I making this up? <laughs> no, no, I'm not making it up. Ephesians chapter 2 says this, that he's called the prince and the power of the air. The prince and the power of the air. Ephesians 6.12, it's our, it's our spiritual warfare scripture. We wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers, against the rulers of darkness of this age, against spiritual host, angelic, demonic, angelic armies of wickedness in the heavenly places, the heavenly places. His domain now is in the atmospheric heavens. However, he has access to two places. He has access to heaven when summoned by God, Job chapter 1, verse 6, only when he's summoned by God, he has to give an account of himself, but he also has access to earth. And when he comes to earth, he comes in one of two ways. He either comes as a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour in 1 Peter 5, 8, or he will come as an angel of light, seeking whom he may deceive. Now, you look at the rest of our world. If you look in the 1040 window in the Islamic countries, or you look at where, where communism just abounds, millions and millions and millions of people have been killed by atheistic communism. He comes as a roaring lion. America has enjoyed the privilege of worshiping the true God, at least for a time. We don't worship him anymore. We've kicked God out of our country. And now, the angel of light, with his deception, is here, in mass in the West. And people are falling for the deception in, in droves. His third abode in the future will be the earth. He'll be booted back to earth, kicked out of heaven. That was Revelation 12, 7. His fourth abode will be the bottomless pit. That's Revelation chapter 20, verse 1 through 3. And the interesting thing there is one, one messenger angel with the exousia, with the authority of God, binds him and throws him into a pit for a thousand years. And then we know his fifth abode, he'll be released to deceive the nations. And everybody wonders, and I bet you wonder this, why in the world was he released to deceive the nations? Well, remember, all these people that have gone into the millennial reign have children. They're all saved, but they have children. Those children have to be saved. Those children have to be tested like all of us were with evil. We have to determine whether we're going to follow God, the true God, or the false God. And that is their time of testing, and he will deceive them. Isn't it amazing? Perfect government perfect world, perfect environment, everything perfect. And then Satan will deceive so many, and he, they will be dealt with 
He will put that, re rebel that rebellion down and they'll go into the lake of fire. And the sixth abode, again, is the lake of fire, Revelation 20, verse 10. And again, all of those who side with him will be in the lake of fire. The third thing that happens is the judgment of the Gentiles. The judgment of the Gentiles. We'll see this in Matthew 25, 31 through 46. As you know, I don't have time to exposit all of this, so I have to give you the short version. Okay? So this judgment is based on whether a person was helpful or hostile to the Jewish people during the tribulation. This is called the sheep and the goat judgment. The sheep and the goat judgment. And I will turn there and I will give you some brief outline of what this judgment is about. Now again, it's based upon how the people in the tribulation, how the Gentiles treated the Jewish people. Remember, they're running for their lives. They have no food. They have no clothing. They have no shelter. They have no water. There will be Gentiles that stand up and help them, much like in the Holocaust in World War II, when there were people that would stand up and help the Jewish people, hide them from the German atrocity of, of, of exterminating as many as they could in Nazi Germany. There were heroes then. There's heroes today. Now, in Matthew chapter 25, We'll pick up the narrative in verse 31. Jesus says, When the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the holy angels with him, then he will sit on his throne of his glory. And he will put on his right hand the sheep and on his left hand the goats. Okay? We, I don't believe, we will be involved in this judgment. This is a judgment of the nations. This is the judgment at the end of the tribulation period on how those people treated the Jewish people. So, if you do happen to get there, do not get on the left side. That's all you want to know. Don't get on the goat side. Get on the sheep side. Just kidding. You're going to be wherever he puts you. But So and this, this is based upon, they're wondering, what is this based on? Verse 35, for I was hungry and you gave me food. I was thirsty and you gave me drink. I was a stranger and you took me in. I was naked, you clothed me. I was sick, you visited me. And I was in prison, you came to me. Let that... Just settle for just a second. Antichrist will kill, but also Antichrist will imprison during the tribulation period. And I can say that that prison term that you serve there will not be pleasant. Then the righteous will answer, when in the world did we do all these things? And Jesus said in verse 40, and the king will answer and say to them, assuredly I say to you, inasmuch as you did it to one of the least of the, my brethren, you did it to me. Then he addresses the other group, the goat group. And he will say to those on his left hand, Depart from me, you curse, verse 41, into everlasting fire prepared for the devil and his angels. Just take a hard stop there. Hell, the lake of fire, separation from God, was prepared for the devil and his angels, not humanity. God has provided humanity with an escape from that, his son dying on the cross, taking all the wrath of God in their place. Whoever believes and receives the gift that Jesus gives to humanity on the cross will be saved. That's how that thing works. And then they were said, when I was hungry and I gave you, and you were thirsty and all that stuff and naked, you didn't do anything. You didn't do anything. And their destiny will be this, verse 46, and these will go away into everlasting punishment. And I don't know if you remember this, but I made an emphasis on this in the past. That word everlasting is aionios, aionios, and it means eternal, everlasting punishment. It's not a consuming fire. It's not something that just goes away. It is everlasting punishment, but the righteous into eternal life, aionios, aionios, eternal, forever life. What you do with Jesus Christ here, will determine your forever. It's a forever existence. We are all eternal beings. Either we're going to live with him forever or separated from him forever. And that is the most tragic thing that I can ever think of because people have rejected and rejected and rejected and rejected probably who knows how many times because I think God is persistent. I think he keeps coming. He keeps coming. But there is a day when it's no more. And he says, okay, you can have what you want. Separation from me. Now, think about this. 
Again, these people that are supporting, these sheep that are on the, on the right hand, that are doing the, the will of God, how do they possibly do this? They're facing death. They're facing prison themselves. They're facing torture. How do you do that? How do they do it in Nazi Germany in World War II? How do they do it throughout the world today? Because you know, I've already mentioned this many times, that the church today, the true church, the one that really worships the Lord Jesus Christ, is being persecuted now more than ever in the history of the world, and more are dying now than ever through all of time until this time. All the martyrs of the past, there's more dying now than in all the past. That is an astounding number. Now, you have to consider all the Christians that were killed in China. Some people think 30, 40 million Christians died in the Chinese Revolution. We're living in it. We're insulated here, folks. We're insulated. We don't get the news of what's going on with the rest of the world. They don't want to tell you what's going on. You're insulated. How do people stand? Well, let, me, let me say this. How do we overcome Satan and his threats of persecution? You know this because Revelation 12, 11 has told you. Number one, by the blood of the Lamb. You won't be able to stand unless you have been covered by the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ, your sins forgiven, and he is dwelling in you along with the Spirit of the living God. It's Christ in us, our hope of glory. It is not us. It will not be our strength. Secondly, by the word of their testimony. Now, word, your, your testimony is your spoken word. You're speaking the truth. That's what we do today in this culture that has a worldview that is so contrary to the Bible. We are to speak to the culture a worldview that reflects the Bible, a biblical worldview. That is what we are to do. So we use our words, but it's also action. How will you do this? How are you doing this today? Through the Holy Spirit's power. We can't do it again on our own. We will be indoctrinated if we do not stick close to God. There's a, remember, there's a planned indoctrination that is going on right now to change the way you think so you become good global citizens. That is the goal. That is the goal. That's the reason for the open borders. That's the reason for the sieve of people coming in from the south. Open borders. That's part of the plan, part of the deception. And number three, and this is probably the most significant, by not loving their lives to the death. And again, every true believer must be ready to die for their faith. Not just those in foreign lands, but it might come to our house someday. How will I do that? I'm not a courageous person. I can't do that. Again, it has to be the Holy Spirit, rod of iron up my spine, that allows me to stand. Notice what is not said. How we deal with this evil. How they are going to deal with the Antichrist. It doesn't say form a militia. It doesn't say fight to the death. Get your guns. Make sure you get plenty of ammo. It's not saying that. It's not saying to store up your food. It doesn't say get generators. Buy water purifiers. By the way, those who are looking for the Antichrist, you look at Christian TV. And there's all kinds of ministries trying to sell you things to help you survive during the tri tribulation period. Let me suggest something to you. The church's focus is Christ, not the Antichrist. Not the Antichrist. We will have an idea if we are living to see this. And I think we, well, I used to think I was going to be raptured, but now I'm, I'm getting old and I might just go the regular way, but if it comes during my lifetime, and I pray that it does, I think that, you know, I'm still believing it will. At least I can believe that, okay? I can hope. Uh, we will see the Antichrist come to power slowly. And we may be able to identify the person that's, that's getting things in order for that covenant to be signed, that document to be signed in Daniel 9.27, that peace, that, that peace treaty. Between the, anti between the nations of the world and Israel and allows them to build their temple. We might be able to see that happening and go, oh, I can identify that dude. I've studied scripture. This is what is happening. This is what is happening. However, 
The church is, look, is told to look forward to Jesus Christ, 1 Corinthians 1, 7, so that you are not lacking in any gift, awaiting eagerly. Notice the word usage, awaiting eagerly. That's watching for the revelation of our Lord Jesus Christ. I don't know where you're at. Are you awaiting eagerly? I mean, I could almost jump. If I could jump, I would jump, okay? Jump. I, I am awaiting eagerly the return of Jesus Christ. Titus 2.13, looking for or watching for the blessed hope and appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior Christ. 1 Thessalonians 1.10, and wait for his son. Watch for his son whom he raised from the dead. That is Jesus who rescues us from the wrath to come. By the way, I don't think we experience any of the wrath of the tribulation. Are we to be prepared for disasters? You bet. You bet. It's prudent. It's prudent to have some food. It's prudent to have some water. It's prudent to have a little ammo. Might want to de delete that. I don't know. but <laughs> <laughs> Slingshots. Okay, bows. If we have something. But are we fearful of the Antichrist? And I would say a resounding no. I do not plan on seeing that dude. Well, unless I see him rising to power. But I won't see him in power. And I won't see anything that he puts on this earth. Folks, the church is indebted to the Jewish people. We are to help them in their crisis. Help them in Nazi Germany. Help them in the tribulation period. But folks, we're called to help them today. The church is indebted to the Jewish people. Romans 15.27 says this, It pleased them, and if you were in context looking at that, that them is the church in Macedonia and Achaia. Those two churches are Gentile churches, and those Gentile churches were called to help the people of, of Israel the, in Jerusalem. It, it pleased them indeed, and they are their debtors. For if the Gentiles have been partakers of their spiritual things, their duty is to minister them in material things. You know, there's one thing saying, I'll pray for you. And I think that is important. But it's also another thing to say, I'll pray for you. I'll help you. I'll step in to your situation. I'll enter into your situation. That's a whole different level, isn't it? That's a whole different level. Romans 11, 16 through 18. That talks about the church being grafted into Israel and enjoying the blessings of the Jewish people. Now, we support, a because of these verses, really, we support a Jewish ministry in Israel. It is called For Zion's Sake. It's Calvary Chapel, Jerusalem. And we have visited on a couple of occasions. And what they do is they distribute all kinds of clothing and things that help those Jews that are making aliyah. Aliyah simply means they're going home. They're ascending to God. They're going to Jerusalem. They're re-entering the land to become the Jewish people. And, and uh, Bradley and his wife and his family and, they, and their church, they have a, a clothing ministry. They get these big shipments from all over the world, and they clothe, and they, and they actually do something. We support that ministry. And Genesis 12, 3, folks, still applies. I'll bless them that bless thee and curse them that curse thee. And, folks, I hope that this 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 administration doesn't turn their backs on the nation of Israel. Next thing that happens is the resurrection of the Old Testament saints. That's Daniel chapter 12, verse 2. This is the fourth thing. And many of them that sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake. You see, the Old Testament saints, some to everlasting life, some to shame and everlasting contempt. You need to know that Israel will have a huge role in the Messianic kingdom, a huge role. All of the Jews on planet Earth will be living in Israel. And I have a picture here of the promise, the promised land. Now, I want you to notice this is Israel today. Notice the land area. Notice this is the Golan, the Golan, which Obama, Biden, the world, the United Nations, everyone wants them to give this up. Give this up. That would leave them a little sliver. Now notice the sliver of land that Israel already has, the size of New Jersey. And they want to take even a bigger gouge out of that so they are almost defenseless on this narrow border. But notice the promised land. It extends. This is where all the Jews will live. 
This is where the Messianic, not the Messianic, this is, this is where the Jewish people will be ruling. Jesus will be reigning in Jerusalem. He'll be on the throne of David. I think David's going to even be on, on some sort of throne. And the Jewish people are going to be ruling this area. There will be Gentiles that will be ruling in other areas. It's probably going to be you, okay? If you've been faithful to Christ, you're going to, remember you're going to have rewards, loss of rewards. I think those are ruling situations throughout the rest of the world. But the focus of the world is going to be Israel. It's going to be Jerusalem. That's where Messiah is going to be. Ezekiel says there's going to be a temple there. There's going to be a temple there. So the Jewish people will have governmental rule, Deuteronomy 15.6 and Deuteronomy 28.1, if you wanted to look at that. The next thing that happens is the resurrection of the tribulation saints. Revelation 20, verse 4, And I saw thrones, and they sat on them, and judgment was committed to them. Then I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded for their witness to Jesus. Those are the tribulation folks. And for the word of God, who had not worshipped the beast or his image, or had not received his mark on their foreheads or on their hands, and they lived and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. So church saints, tribulation saints, Old Testament saints, will also have some sort of reign, all of them, will have some sort of reigning position in the millennial kingdom. Now, I want to take just a moment to discuss something with you. It's called the first resurrection. The first resurrection. And it's in Revelation chapter five or 20, verses 5 and 6. We're talking about those tribulation saints that were raised up in verse 4. And then it says in verse 5, But the rest of the dead did not live again until the thousand years were finished. The rest of the dead are those who will experience the second death, separation from God. Blessed and holy is he who takes part in the first resurrection. That is what we plan on being in. If you're a believer in Jesus, you will be part of the first resurrection. So, the tribulation saint will complete the first resurrection. All to eternal life. Jesus is first. He is first. 1 Corinthians 15, 23, Colossians 1, 18. The next one is the raptured church. I believe that's us. Okay? Get us out. Take us, Lord, please. And then, then the two witnesses in the middle of the tribulation in Revelation 11, the Old Testament saints in Daniel 12, and then the tribulation saints in Revelation 20. Now, the resurrection of the lost is at the end of the thousand years. They will appear at the great white throne judgment. And we've been through this scripture several times, and we'll go through it in depth when we get there and we actually go through those scriptures uh, in, in our coming teachings. But remember, the books are opened. The books are what you have done with your life. And then there's another book that is open. It is the book of life. And those people's names will not be written in the book of life. The important thing is that your name is in the book of life. It's in the book of life because you believe in Jesus Christ as your Savior. Okay? That is the book of life. Those whose names are not found in the book of life will be thrown into the lake of fire, burning with brimstone forever and ever and ever. It's, it's a foreverlasting punishment. Now, believers will die once physically, except unless you're raptured, okay? Once physically, but never spiritually. We are never separated from God. Remember, death is separation. We experience the pain of that here, don't we? When a loved one dies and passes on. But spiritually, we never experience absence from the body, present with the Lord. In a moment, in a twinkling, Boom, one sixth billionth of a second. Boom, before God. Jesus said in John eleven twenty five. 25, you've heard me say this so many times. It's one of my favorite verses. He's telling Martha, Mary and Martha, remember, Lazarus has died. And why have you delayed Jesus? You could have saved his life. You could have healed him. And he's in the grave and he's, he's starting to smell. And Jesus shows up and they're all disturbed. And Jesus says to Martha, said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live even though he dies. And whoever lives and believes in me will never, never, never die. And then he says to, to Martha, do you believe this, Martha? And he says that to us today. Do you believe that? Yes, I do. That is, a, that is a marvelous hope, a marvelous hope. Then the next thing will be the marriage feast that happens in the 75-day interval. 
That's in Matthew 25, 1 through 13. I don't have time to even go into that. But it actually talks about people having on the right wedding garments, people, uh, people being invited and, 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 and rejecting the call. And then he sends out other people to bring more people in to the marriage feast. The marriage feast is not the marriage supper. Okay, I'll clarify that in just a second. So, did you put the marriage supper of the Lamb up? Because I'm waiting. Well, just bear with me, Reagan. Sorry. I think the first thing that happens after we're raptured, after the church is taken home, after the bride is taken, the first thing on the agenda is the Bema Seat Judgment, where we receive rewards and loss of rewards. I didn't put it on the tape, on the overhead, because we've covered this most recently. That's 1 Corinthians chapter 3 and 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Okay, you'll find those verses there. The next thing is the marriage supper of the Lamb, and I believe that occurs in heaven after the rapture of the church. Revelation chapter 19, verse 6 through 9. I will read that to you. And I heard, as it were, the voice of a great multitude and the sound of many waters and the sound of mighty thunder saying, Alleluia, for the Lord our God omnipotent reigns. Let us be glad and rejoice and give him glory, for the marriage of the Lamb has come and his wife has made herself ready. Remember, you are the wife. You are the bride of Christ. And to her it was granted to be, to be arrayed in fine linen, clean and bright, for the linen is the righteous acts of the saints. Then he said to me, Right blessed are those those who are called to the marriage supper of the Lamb. I believe this occurs when we're in heaven. If you are a post-tribber, if you are a post-tribber, where are you going to fit the marriage supper of the Lamb? Where does it fit into your eschatology? It's hard to stick it in there. It's hard to put it in there. You have to put it on earth. I think it's in heaven. The marriage feast occurs on earth during the 75-day interval. In a Jewish wedding ceremony, remember, there's the marriage supper. It is consummated, and then we have the feast. It's a seven-day feast that occurs. Kind of goes along with seven years being in heaven after the rapture, doesn't it? I mean, kind of goes along together. So the the guests are the Old Testament and the New Testament saints. Those are called the friends of the bridegroom. Now you are the church. What is your status now with Jesus as far as being the bride? You're an engagement period, aren't you? You are the you are the betrothed. Ephesians chapter one, verse fourteen tells us exactly who we are. Verse 13, I'll start there. In him you were also trusted after you heard the word of truth. That's how you become the bride of Christ. You trusted. You put your trust in Jesus Christ. The gospel of your salvation, in whom also having believed, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. You belong to Jesus Messiah. You are the blood of Christ. You are the bride of Christ, purchased by his blood who is the guarantee, the down payment, the earnest payment of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession to the praise of his glory. That redemption of the purchased possession is when we're taken to Father's house. The whole thing is complete. The whole thing is complete. The marriage feast, the friends of the bride, the bridegroom attend, the Old Testament saints attend, but the marriage supper is special for you. You are special, the church age. The Old Testament saints participate, but it's the feast. The tribulation saints participate, but it's the feast. You are the church. You are the church of the living God. You are special in his eyes. In closing, the 75-day interval. Now, I don't know what you're experiencing in your life right now. Some people are experiencing some really tough stuff. That's how life is. Some people are coming out of something difficult and things are rising. Some people don't know this, but you're getting ready to go into something tough. You're getting ready to go into a downer time. So that's just that's life on earth. Life is just that way. Remember your dash. We talked about the dash, the time in, your birth date, 
your time out, your exit date. In between is your dash. What you do for Jesus Christ in your dash is essential. We know that the tribulation will be awful. We know that. Our world is racing towards this at at, at an amazing pace. The signs of the times are evident. And we as the bride, we as the people of God, we who are encouraged to study prophecy are to have a heads up on what is coming and not taken by, by surprise or be shocked. They are evident. Fortunately, I do not believe that tribulation pain is in our future. The Bible tells us it will be spared from the wrath of God. And I've taken great pains to try to explain why I believe in a pre-tribulation rapture. I've attempted to prove this. But again, please let me preface this. There are people that believe in a mid-trib. There are people that believe in a pre-wrath. There are people that believe in a post-trib that are still orthodox in their beliefs. These are brilliant people, many of them, and they can make a strong argument. I believe the pre-tribulation rapture has the greatest legs to stand on. None of these views are perfect, but I believe the pre-trib view has most evidence, at least for me. So whether you believe in the other ones, you're still in the family. Just know that, okay? Now, let me suggest this to you. I expect to get, I don't expect to experience the wrath of God but I do expect it to get really bad for the true church. I do expect that. Because you look at the rest of the world, and you look at the United States, there will be a time when we're not protected anymore. There will be a time, because we can't cast God out. You can't kill 60 million babies with impunity, murder them, and think you're going to be blessed. You can't kick God out of your government. You can't kick him out of your schools. You can't kick him out of the church. A lot of churches have just booted him out and worshiped some form of God that they've made up. You can't do that and be blessed. It's already awful for many in the true church throughout the world. As I said, persecution is rampant. The roaring lion is at work. In America, the angel of light is working. But the roaring lion is getting ready to pounce. Can you feel it? Can you feel it? You know something's changing. Being politically correct is the clarion cry of our day. Not agreeing with what the Bible calls sin is considered hate speech. If you believe this word, you are considered a hater in the eyes of this world. And you, a Bible-believing Christian, are looked at as an intolerant bigot. And we've heard those words. It's permeating our country. There is pain and distress and abundance just being here. And we have been sheltered because we have been blessed because we have worshiped the true God. America and her people have been blessed, but I would suggest to you those days are a fond memory. Our best days are not ahead as a nation. Our best days are ahead as kingdom, as belonging to a different kingdom, a different place. It's not here. America has long since abandoned God and has chosen to worship the creation, humanism, rather than the creator. Jesus gave his disciples a heads up, folks, on how to overcome all the persecution that's inevitable. He's telling his disciples in John 16, 33, he's giving them a heads up prior to the cross. And he warns them something very specific. He says, things are going to get tough for you guys. I'm going to the cross to die, but it's going to get scary for you. His cure was his peace that is available to us even in the most arduous situations. Now watch this. Jesus said in John 16, 33, indeed the hour is coming. It's the hour of his death. Jesus was very aware of this. Yes has now come, literally hours before the cross. And he says this to his disciples who believe they're so loyal that you will be scattered each to his own. It'll be all for one. Just run for your life. And, I, and will leave me alone. Let me ask you. Do you ever feel alone? That you've been left alone? Abandoned by your family. Abandoned by your friends. Abandoned by your workplace. Abandoned. I mean, this is a feeling that is real. 
And Jesus says, and yet I am not alone. Believe that. Believe that. Because the Father is with me. Just put that indelibly imprinted in your, in your minds. The Father is with me. If everyone deserts, the Father is with me. These things I have spoken to you. In me, you may have peace. In the world, you will have tribulation. You will have thalispus, crushing, stress, squeezed in. But be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. That be of good cheer, you know what that means? Be of good courage, church. Be of good courage. I have overcome the world. As we get closer to the tribulation, as our world changes, there will be much pressure to scatter and to isolate. Look what COVID has done. It has caused the church to scatter and to isolate. And many are comfortable now with the Facebook message, which I think is, is a great way to get the information out and that sort of thing. But that does not replace the church, folks. It really doesn't. The church is fellowship. The church is doing life together. The church is serving together. You can't do that in your living room. And I believe that many people have gotten comfortable with a cup of coffee and turning me on and turning me off when they're ready, flicking to somebody else. You know, that is not the church. That is not the church. Scatter and isolate. Don't isolate. Do, I'm going to have several do's here. Do stick together. Hebrews 10.25, let us not give up, give up meeting together as some are in the habit, becomes a habit, the habit of doing, but encourage one another even more as we see the day approaching. You cannot encourage one another unless you're with one another. Okay, that's an important part of this. And then you want to really be an overcomer. You must do dwell in Christ. And folks, that means make Christ your home. Menno, dwell in him. Make him your home. And this takes time. This takes time. You will must have to take time away from all of the distractors, the television, your computers, your iPhones, all of those things that are distractors. Take time away from that. This is your safe place. Dwelling in Christ is your safe place. Do be of good cheer. Do be of good courage. And I would suggest to you, if you do this, you will baffle the world. Blow their minds, folks. Blow their minds. Our attitude, our disposition, our witness will blow their minds. And folks, listen to this. If you do this, we shall overcome. We shall overcome. It's important. And then do tap into Jesus. The Jesus secret is for you. It is for you. The Jesus secret, John 14, 27. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you, not as the world gives, do I give to you. Let not your heart be troubled. And hear this, do not be afraid, neither let it be afraid. Don't be afraid, don't be afraid. Fear not, fear not, fear not. Do choose peace, folks. It is there for us. My peace I give you. Don't allow the world, don't allow your circumstances. It's not easy living in this world. Don't allow those to drag you down. You are of another world. You are of another kingdom, another place. You are not home yet, but you're almost there. We don't know how close we are. We're almost there. And do remember, you are the bride of Christ. You are special. And Jesus is preparing a place specially for you. Isn't that amazing? That's, there's intimacy there. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, I would have told you. So I go to prepare a place for you, he's telling his disciples. By extension, us, individually, our place. Our place. And do remember, Jesus is coming. And folks, let me say this resoundingly. He really is. He really is. That should perk us up. And do our job here. Watch. Be ready. How do we do that? Occupy. Occupy your space. Be a, be a voice for the Lord Jesus. No passivity. Resist. Resist all the enemy's attempts to keep you squelched in a corner. And then fight the good fight. Folks, this is our dash. In, out, dash. Fight the good fight. Occupy. Resist. Fight the good fight. Your little dash. You don't know when it's going to end. This is our time. 
This is our time. And then, folks, then have a spirit of optimism. A spirit of optimism. This is not a time for Christians to look like this. This is not our time right here. Oh, it's, I'm so miserable. This is so terrible. Everybody hates me. I want my maple right here. Yeah. I just love that picture. But I don't like it when I'm doing it. <laughs> yeah, no. Practice optimism, folks. Listen to this. Let me ask you this question. Are you optimistic about your future? Or are you pessimistic? Are you optimistic or pessimistic? Think about this. Four things. There are two rooms, one full of brand new toys, the other full of hay and horse manure. Two children are taken into them, one a pessimist and the other an optimist. The pessimist looks at, looked at the first room, cried out because all the wonderful toys would soon be broken, hasn't touched one. Pessimist. The optimist, on the other hand, is in the other room shoveling. I know there's got to be a horse in here somewhere, he said. That's the optimist, shoveling the poop and finding something good in it. Secondly, somebody has well said that there are only two kinds of people in the world. Those who wake up in the morning and say this, Good, Lord. Good morning, Lord. Good morning, Lord. I hope you say that. Good morning, Lord. You are with me today. And there are those who wake up in the morning and say, Good Lord, it's morning. Optimist or pessimist? During the Battle of Britain, someone said to a man on the street in London, things look pretty dark down here, don't they? The man replied, but the king says there's hope, sir. There's hope. The king says there's hope, sir. Be an optimist. And finally, a shoe salesman, upon finding out that in his new territory, no one wore shoes. He wrote the company and said, don't send any shoes. No one here wears them. Another salesman in the same territory wrote the company and said, send all the shoes you can. Nobody has any. Are you an optimist or are you a pessimist? That is the, that is the, that is the concern. Folks, do practice. This takes practice because it's easy to be a pessimist. It's easy to look at the gloom and the doom. We're living in it all the time. We have to go beyond what we're living in. Practice optimism. The king is coming. That's optimism. The, you are the bride of Christ. There is a new world coming, and it's just around the bend. There's a new world coming, and you know the song, this one's coming to an end. Yes, it is. And know that it will be glorious. And think about this. And most, some of you know this song. What a day that will be when my Jesus I shall see. When I look upon his face, the one who saved me by his grace, when he takes me by the hand and leads me to the promised land, what a day, glorious day that will be. Folks, practice optimism and blow the world's mind. The king is coming. The king is coming, and he's coming for us. Yes, he is. So. Thank you. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for this time. Thank you, Father, that the 75-day interval, who knows that it could have been exciting. <laughs> All these things happening. And, uh, I don't plan on being here for most of that, Lord, unless you take us back at that point. But uh, thank you that you are a God of order, a God of structure, a God that has everything planned out. Thank you that there will be a millennial kingdom that we will reign with you in. You will give us positions of authority based upon our faithfulness to you here. Thank you that you are a generous God. Thank you that you give us way more than we ever deserve. Thank you for your loving kindness, your chesed, your loving kindness that is above anything we can imagine. And thank you that we have the blessed hope of the return of our Lord Jesus Christ. Our world is getting darker. You said it would be that way. May we not be shocked. May we not go into despair. But may we have this feeling of optimism that the king is coming and everything is in order. Though chaos abounds around us, it is in order because you are a God of order. We put our trust in you. Thank you for this time that you've given us to study the inerrant, infallible word of the living God. 
thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen.